I'm John Chowney with Campbellsville University welcoming our audience back to dialogue on public issues. Voters in Kentucky will be going to the polls on Tuesday, May 21st for this year's primary election and will be selecting from four candidates in each of the Democratic and Republican primaries to run in the November election for Governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We're continuing today in our series of interviews with candidates for Kentucky Governor and I'm very pleased to be interviewing today one of the Republican candidates, State Representative Robert Goforth. Representative, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome to Campbellsville. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I, I guess I could start all the way back. I was raised by a single mother, mm -hmm. soul crushing poverty. Didn't know if we were going to have a roof over our head or food on the table most of the days. It was tough. Mm -hmm. um, but um, she did what she had to do to make sure that my brothers and I had essential needs. Sometimes, you know, she had to make sure we woke up early for school to get there to eat breakfast and lunch because we didn't have food for dinner. But anyways, uh, uh, growing up, it was, it was pretty tough. I had dropped out of school actually mm -hmm. at 16. Found out I was going to be a father at 17. Mm -hmm. uh, went back and got my GED and then joined the Army. I was a combat engineer in the United States Army for a couple years. Got out, come back home, went to work at Tecumseh Products in Somerset. Okay. Worked there for a couple years until I had a back injury. Hurt myself on the job, hanging the oven there. The doctor that treated me told me I could never do that kind of work again. So. He asked me if I ever had a dream of doing anything mm -hmm. else or what I thought I would do with the rest of my life. And I told him growing up, I had always dreamed of being a pharmacist. Mm. And because my little brother has cerebral palsy and he would have seizures, we'd go to the hospital, he'd get released, we'd go to the pharmacy and that pharmacist would help him mm -hmm. by giving him medicine. Mm -hmm. And so as a child, I thought, wow, if I could ever repay that to someone, if I mm -hmm. could ever help someone like that pharmacist helped me and my family with my little brother, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted mm -hmm. to help people. Well, I'd forgot that dream many years before that, but he encouraged me to apply to the University of Kentucky, mm -hmm. and I did the following day. I started the University of Kentucky as a 23-year-old freshman in 1999. Mm -hmm. Went on, got my doctor of pharmacy degree, came back home, opened up my first store after working hard for two years and saving my money. And then I turned that into four stores, employing numerous people in some of the poorest counties across Kentucky, generating tens of millions in sales, putting mm -hmm. millions of payroll dollars back into those local communities. And then one day I started talking to one of my friends. She's a pharmacist and she worked for the Kentucky Board of Pharmacy and we were talking about these children and them seeing the abuse of drugs mm -hmm. and some of them abusing drugs and we thought, hey, we're pharmacists. We need to use our expert knowledge to go and talk to these children and talk to them about the dangers of drug abuse. So I scheduled a school and she and I went and that day turned into what we call Project Daris now, mm -hmm. D-A-R-I-S. And we went to that school that day and presented and asked those students towards the end of the program about the statistics. One in four students will abuse a drug before they leave school. Mm -hmm. So we asked those students, we said, how many of you have ever abused a drug? And about half of them raised their hand. It was uh, about 250 students in the auditorium mm -hmm. that day. And then we said, how many of you have a fa uh, family member, mother, father, someone you love, uh, or you have abused a drug? Every single one of them mm. raised their hand. Mm -hmm. So after we finished up, uh, we st stood there for a little bit. The line was out the door. Uh, students coming up wanting to share their stories. One young man in particular, he was 15 years old. His mother had died from an overdose. His father was in prison from drug-related charges, and he himself had already overdosed on multiple occasions. We knew we had to do more, and that's when we met Darius's mother, hmm. Melissa, and uh, we started 
the program. It's called Project Dares. They can look us up on Facebook, Project Dares, D-A-R-I-S, or projectdares.com. Since then, we've traveled all over the Commonwealth, probably taught 80 to 90 plus thousand students mm -hmm. medication, safety, substance abuse prevention education. And we do that free of charge. We've mm -hmm. never charged a school a dollar for being there. That led me to the legislature though. Okay. Because I talked to several legislators about providing these students with a continuous educational opportunity. I've mm -hmm. asked for just one question a day at the minimum and give them a quiz on the last day of the week. Mm -hmm. Well, I talked to legislator after legislator, and I know they're busy now that I'm there, <laughs> of right, course, Right. Uh, but I, I wasn't seeing anything progress, and I thought the only way I'm going to be able to really make an impact is if I have a seat at the table. So I ran back last year. I, I sought the nomination when Miss Marie Rader resigned. Mm -hmm. I got the party's nomination, I won the special election, went on to win a primary and a general election, and now back for my second term. Mm -hmm. Now you're from uh, Laurel, County. Laurel County, I live East Bernstein. Right, yes, sir. just east of Somerset. Just east of Somerset. My family's been in that area for at least about seven generations mm -hmm. now, uh, okay. Laurel, Pulaski area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now why did you uh, choose to run for governor? In 2019? Well, there's a lot of reasons why I decided to run for governor. One, most importantly, I think the people need a choice. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we need to dictate who uh, our governor is going to be or our party nominee. I think people should have the right to choose. And even though we have an incumbent, I still think that there's lots of people in our Commonwealth, and that's pretty clear with a 27% approval rating mm -hmm. that decided that they want a choice. Uh, I don't think our current governor is reelectable. The mm -hmm. statistically impossible at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, the approval ratings show that. So I think the people want a choice, and we decided, uh, my running mate and, and myself, Mike Hogan, he's a five-time elected, consecutively elected county attorney of Lawrence County, uh, but we felt like the people deserve a choice and want a choice, mm -hmm. and that's why we decided to run. Can you raise the money? Can you get the exposure oh, yeah. uh, that you need to run against an incumbent governor, one who just had a fundraiser with the vice president and, and so on? Uh, definitely. Uh, so I'll address that in a couple ways. Sure. We already have almost a million dollars in our campaign okay. account and we're raising money every single day. Okay. Uh, the fundraiser with the vice president, I don't think any amount of headlines or campaign cash is going to help this governor get reelected. I think mm -hmm. the people of Kentucky are fed up with the way they've been treated mm -hmm. over the past several years and I think they're ready for a fresh new voice. But that vice president trip here, uh, they didn't raise any money. Mm -hmm. They spent more than they raised. Mm -hmm. uh, they comped almost all of the tickets, the numbers that I was given. He raised 50000 It cost him 125 to put it on. It sounds like there are 75 in the hole on that. Mm -hmm. So they didn't raise any money. Um, it, most of the people that were there got in for free because there wasn't enough people that showed interest to pay to, to show up. Now I respect our president mm -hmm. and I respect our vice president. Mm -hmm. I respect the job that they're doing. I think they have some bad information. I think that they're not listening to Kentucky voters. I think maybe they heard s from some establishment elites uh, or our current governor since he is friends with the current vice president. But I don't think they're listening to Kentucky voters. Mm -hmm. uh, the poll numbers are clear. Mm -hmm. The people of Kentucky want a choice. They want someone to restore civility to that office, and they want someone that respects all Kentuckians, and we haven't seen that. In You've touched on my next question, and that really is, why are you the best candidate in this primary? There are four candidates. Yes. Obviously, Governor Bevin is the candidate uh, of most notoriety, sure. uh, along with yourself as the two elected officials in the race. At least that's what the pundits would say. Sure. Uh, uh, wh wh what why are you the best choice for the Republican Party and then ultimately the voters from your perspective? Well, I'm the best choice because uh, I, I think I provide the Republican Party with the conservative values, plus I'm 
very electable. I think I can be any of the Democrats mm -hmm. in November. Uh, I filed some of the most conservative pieces of legislation in Kentucky history with the fetal heartbeat bill. I filed that last year, the first in the country to make it a felony to perform an abortion after a fetal heartbeat is detected. House Bill 30 uh, that protects our Second Amendment rights and restores everyone with the right that some politicians have enjoyed for years with never being left defenseless in the Commonwealth. Um, but also, I know how to talk to people. I know business. I built a business to tens of millions in sales, put millions back in some of the uh, worth of payroll dollars in some of the poorest communities in our Commonwealth. So. I know business, I know how to talk to people, and I share our conservative uh, social values. I know what it's, what it's going to take to do the job and do the job effectively. Uh, the way that our current administration, our current governor has talked down to people and diminished mm -hmm. them, that hasn't worked, and it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And obviously, with me having the experience in the business world. I've built these businesses, and you don't build these businesses without being able to talk to people and being able to treat people right. Mm -hmm. If you become the Republican nominee going into a fall campaign against one of the three most likely of the four Democratic nominees, what would be the most likely issues in that campaign? Well, and, 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 and this may be a, a, a question you don't want to, pr want to answer, but is there one of those candidates that you think would be the strongest uh, Democratic opponent? I, I don't really think either one of them will be stronger than another whenever it mm -hmm. comes to the general election. Um, they've already proved that time and time again. Uh, it's about protecting life. I think that every Kentuckian in our Commonwealth believes that everyone should have the right to life of which God is the author of mm -hmm. and not man. And not one of those individuals can say that. I mm -hmm. know that uh, one of them serves in the legislature and unfortunately he's voted against some pro-life legislation, but- Doesn't he claim to be pro-life? He's in our pro-life caucus, but voted against pro-life mm -hmm. legislation. And the other two are clearly pro-choice <laughs> candidates. Um, you know, they don't support, uh, or at least most of them don't support our Second Amendment rights. And then some of them, they've been in government for years and they're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, one of them's been up there for 30 plus years. One of them's family's been up there for decades, basically involved in politics. Uh, the other one has been a statewide elected official. They're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we need someone with solutions. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, Mr. Goforth, would be the most challenging issue facing Commonwealth o over the next four years? And specifically, what would you do to address that issue as governor? I, I think we, we have a couple uh, issues that are extremely challenging right now. Of course, our pension system mm -hmm. definitely needs reform. But the drug epidemic in our children, as I stated, one in four are abusing a drug before they ever leave school. It is horrific, mm -hmm. the amount of people that are addicted to drugs. We're never going to stop it retrospectively. Mm -hmm. We have to focus on our children. We have to provide them with an ongoing, continuous educational opportunity so they will make better choices. Every piece of data always has shown that prevention is the key. Every dollar you spend in prevention will save you seven dollars on the other side. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, but w more than money, we're talking about lives. Mm -hmm. We're talking about lives of our children. And it's not going to happen by painting a rock like this current, I mean, that's great, make people feel good. You paint a rock, you hide it in, the, in different places mm -hmm. throughout the city. But that's not going to stop it. We need to educate them, and we need to educate them properly. And it has to start as soon as we get them. We have them about 180 plus school days a year. Some of these children see it 365. Mm -hmm. We have to start as soon as we get them. People wasn't sure how it was going to turn out whenever I told them, I want to talk to your kindergarten students whenever I started this medication safety program and mm -hmm. substance abuse prevention education. We went to a school in Wayne County, 
over 250 plus kindergarten students. And those teachers and that principal there that day, they said, how are you going to keep their attention? Are you sure they're going to be able to learn anything? Whenever I left there that day, every teacher in there praised us. Every, the principal, everyone, those students could answer every question that I presented them with. I gave them some tough um, mm -hmm. material and, and they knew it. They knew it when we left. But we, we do it age appropriately. We, we let them have fun while we're sure. going over the material and that's what they have to mm -hmm. have. Um, and, and so the, it's more than just an opioid epidemic. Right. It's a drug epidemic right. of all substances of abuse. We have to fix that first and foremost. And we also have to fix our pension system. We know that KERS non-hazardous has some issues uh, deeply right now. They need a cash infusion. The other uh, pension programs, they're actually getting back on track. They're, the numbers are climbing. This governor claims he funded the pensions. He's never funded the pensions. The governor doesn't fund the pensions. The legislature funds the mm -hmm. pensions. And he vetoed the bill to fund the pensions last year. Mm -hmm. We had to override that veto in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where he gets these claims that he's funded the pensions. He hasn't funded anything. He vetoed the bill to fund the pensions last year. Mm -hmm. We had to override those. People don't understand that. You know, that, that's one of the things people say, he's taken on the challenge. Well, since his inception, since he's been the governor, he's taken over that pension board, KRS. They paid out $146 million in management fees alone last year. $146 million in management fees alone. This is his pension board that he revamped, the people of his choosing, his hedge fund buddies, and they, they also tried to do away with a provision in the special session, the pension bill that he proposed, and he says he doesn't, but I have the letter from his attorney. They're the ones who drafted it uh, with LRC. Uh, I, he's revamped this board. These are all of his buddies that are supposedly the experts in investments, but 146, at 10 times the rate that the legislative and the judicial fund paid for management fees. 10 times the rate, over double the rate of what the Kentucky Teachers Retirement System paid for their management fees. There's a real issue there. They tried to strip a provision that says no elected official or pension board member may profit off of that pension system's investments for a period of five years after they're no longer serving in that role. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. There's something not right there. So as governor, what would you do differently uh, well, in, in terms of, an, of the KERS system, which is the worst yeah, case scenario, yeah. but, the, but the pension issues in general? Yeah. That, that's the one that nobody's talking about right now. Yeah. The one that's getting most of the attention, of course, is the teacher system because yeah. of the vocal uh, support from the KEA. Yeah. Well, w we have to figure out why are we paying 10 times the rate that the mm -hmm. legislative and the judicial funds are paying mm -hmm. for their management fees. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. That's a, a hundred. Would you restructure that board? Well, is that one of the solutions that you would put on the table? We definitely need to restructure that board, figure out what's going on with those investments. Mm -hmm. Why are those management fees so excessively high? Mm -hmm. the, the rate, I'm not, I'm not even talking about the numbers here. I'm talking about why is the rate double than what the teachers have paid for their management fees mm -hmm. percentage-wise? Why is it 10 times the rate that the legislative and the judicial funds are paying? I opted out of the legislative pension. I don't even accept health care benefits. I've never taken a dollar of my legislative pay. I've donated it all back to charities in my district. Mm -hmm. So uh, w we can fix this thing if we start working together, bring all the stakeholders to the table, bring Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. to the table, and do this thing right instead of thinking that one man alone has all the answers. Mm -hmm. One person alone doesn't have all the answers. If we come together, we can solve our tough do, challenges. Do you think, and, and I know this is kind of a broad question with lots of complexities uh, in the context of the entire question, but can you do that? Can, you, can we solve the problem without affecting current retirees' benefits 
or current employees' future benefits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we can in House Bill 504 that was presented, uh, sponsored by newly elected Representative Scott Lewis. I mm -hmm. co-sponsored the bill. It does that. It mm -hmm. saves more money than the sewer bill that was passed last uh -huh. year and struck down by the Supreme Court. It saves more money, but it hasn't got heard, and I don't know why. I don't. I have some assumptions, but I don't like to just assume anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does save the defined benefit plan. It doesn't force people into a 401A, 401K style plan. My concern with those is the safety net of economic security mm -hmm. for the current and future employees. We have, uh, our teachers don't get to draw social security. We have to make sure that they have a safety net. We have to do it in a way that is fair and just to all people. Those funds haven't been fully funded in years, and that's why we're in the shape that we're in. I understand that. But we can do this in a way that's fair and just, and we can do it in a way that saves that economic security for these mm -hmm. people. Uh, and, and as we do this interview in late March to be uh, broadcast probably sometime in April prior to the election. We, we've heard quite a bit of uh, uh, discussion in the public domain uh, with the current governor, current education commissioner about teachers uh, calling in sick and then going to Frankfurt. As governor, what would be your comment with that kind of situation? Well, I've talked to all of those teachers and I think their voices need to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to them and I, I said, send two representatives from each school. Mm -hmm. You never have to call out class. You, there's 1,250 plus uh, public schools in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. We'd have over 2,000 people there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can show a presence if you want to send two representatives from each school. You don't have to shut down the school districts. Mm -hmm. I understand them wanting their voices being heard. They're scared to death. They've mm -hmm. had someone that has maligned them and diminished them and, and threatened them and you know threatened to, to take their economic security away from them. And um, they just wanna make sure that their voices are heard. And I understand that their voices can be heard. Uh, I've talked to them on several occasions, many teachers, and I've told them, I said, get together, send two representatives from each school. Your mm -hmm. voices will clearly be heard if you want your voices heard in Frankfurt. And they need to be heard. Mm -hmm. They need to be heard because what I've learned in my short time in Frankfurt is uh, the, peoples that, the people that show up, mm -hmm. the people that make sure that their voice is heard, that's who they listen to. Sure. How would you address, uh, Representative, the continuing budget revenue challenges facing the Commonwealth? Well, first of all, uh, we give away more than what we take in. <laughs> I mean, they, there's the first thing. Yeah. Um, and people say, well, th those are breaks to bring in jobs. Not all of them are breaks mm -hmm. to bring in jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're giving away a ton of money. And, and when I say a ton, uh, literally a ton, I don't know mm -hmm. how much over $10 billion weighs, but I'd say it's probably over a ton. And we're, we're giving away almost just as much or as much as what we bring in. And there's about 600 plus exemptions. And we need to look at every single one of those exemptions and see how does that actually impact the Commonwealth of us not collecting that money. Mm -hmm. uh, look at all the border counties. 50% uh, of our population does live in a bo border county. Mm -hmm. So it'd be very easy for them if we start collecting those exemptions uh, for some services or for some different things that they may be able to just go right across the state line and utilize that service. We need to see how it will impact Kentucky. And I would say that we have a great chance of impacting Kentucky in a positive way if we'll go through every single one of those 600 plus exemptions and start looking at that and see what we need to collect, what we need to start sunsetting, and there's our revenue stream. We don't have to raise revenue on the backs of uh, hardworking Kentuckians when we're given away as much as we bring in already. So basically what I understand, you're advocating tax reform in the context of going through the current system yes. and examining the tax deductions, tax credits yes. uh, that are given to various interest. Yeah, various interests. Mm -hmm. They're not all employers. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, a, 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 
there's some large ones, mm -hmm. pharmacy, residential utilities, food. We don't have to collect those. Mm -hmm. We don't have to collect those, but th there's over 600 that we need to look at that we possibly do need to be collecting mm -hmm. that are not bringing a positive economic impact to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have major infrastructure needs, and I have to lobby for a couple of projects here. Sure. Uh, I don't get paid to do this, but we've been working on the Heartland Parkway to connect yeah. the Louis Nunn Parkway and the Bluegrass Parkway along 55 corridor, also 210 connecting Campbellsville into I-65, just a couple of projects in this area. What would you do to enhance funding for projects in general? Well, l let's go back to those exemptions. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a ton of money left on the table. And you have, uh, I just have to say, you have one of the most powerful legislators in Frankfurt mm -hmm. right here in Taylor County right now with Bam Carney. Mm -hmm. He's the majority floor leader. So, I mean, <laughs> if anybody can get it done for this area, it would definitely be Bam Carney. We remind him every day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll remind him too whenever Please I talk do. to him. I'll call uh, it. Rural economic yeah. development is yeah. also very important. Uh, you're from Laurel County, not unlike Taylor yeah. County. What, as governor, what would you help do to promote rural economic development? So that we've been left behind. Mm -hmm. and, and I've said it time and time again, uh, you know, these work-ready communities, mm -hmm. and I believe Taylor County is a work-ready yes. community, but some of our areas in eastern Kentucky, we don't meet the checklist. Mm -hmm. We don't meet the checklist for work-ready, and so the Cabinet for Economic Development is not recruiting people to our area, mm -hmm. but we have great people. Sure. We have a great workforce. We just happen to, we can't meet all the checklists. Why do we have to have a certain percentage of college graduates to bring in a factory there? Mm -hmm. We have hardworking individuals that are ready to go to work, that have to leave their counties on a regular basis, and we need to bring those jobs there. One of them that s was supposed to come in, inner blue, supposed to come into Pikeville. The, they make the big press announcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They finally get there, they're looking at the site, they tell everybody, they get their hopes up, and then they say, the soil doesn't meet our standards. We mm -hmm. cannot build on this location. We have an 18-acre industrial park in Jackson County, a 200,000 square foot slab ready to go. The best technology in the Commonwealth, we have some of the greatest people sure. ready to go to work, but we don't meet the checklist. But we could fulfill the needs of places like Inner Blue every single day, and we need them to start looking at places in Eastern Kentucky because we have some of the best people in the Commonwealth and some of the best people in the country, and we are tired of being left behind. We are out of time, sir. I apologize for running out of time. Let me wish you Godspeed. Thank you. Out on the campaign trail. This is State Representative Robert Goforth, Thank Republican candidate for state representative in the May 21st primary. And we appreciate our uh, audience for being with us once again and in encourage you to watch our series of interviews with all the candidates for Kentucky Attorney General and Kentucky Governor and vote your conscience in the May 21st primary. Thank you.